Welcome to Fun with Annuities, where every single week I welcome a celebrity guest expert that can help you maximize chapter two of your life. Listen, learn, laugh, and love every minute of the most unique financial podcast on the planet. Let's get to it. Welcome to Fun with Annuities. I'm your host, Stan, the Annuity Man, America's Annuity Agent, licensed in all 50 states. I'm glad you joined us today, and welcome to all of you podcast listeners and all of you people out there that are watching us on the Fun with Annuities YouTube channel, whether it's live or it's recorded. I am very, very honored to have a special guest on today. His name is Mark Avery, and he is so overqualified to be on this this podcast, it's scary. I mean, he is kind of a hero in the retirement system. Um, Some people call him a pension rock star. Some have referred to him as one of the world's 30 top financial players. Now think about that for a second of all the players in the financial world. He's, he's known as he's in that top 30. He's, he's really a legend. And to me, he's an inspiration as well, because one of my favorite products on the planet is called a QLAC, a Qualified Longevity Annuity Contract. And Mark's fingerprints are all over this. And some great background on that. I was the first one to write a book on QLACs in 2014 when they first came out. And I was traveling in Chicago when I when they finally got approved. And I locked myself in a hotel room and wrote the bones for the first book that has now, there's been 25,000 or 30,000 copies of the QLAC owner's manual out there and counting Welcome to Fun with Annuities, Mark Avery. Stan, it's a pleasure to be with you. I'm not overqualified for uh, this interview at all. Uh, You do great work, and uh, 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 I'm delighted to be be on here. Well, I mean, you you went to Harvard. You've taught taught at Harvard. You got a a law degree. I mean, (laughs) your your resume is, is huge. I would like to just jump in and... Maybe you can give the listeners and viewers the background of QLAC, your involvement, and how it all came to pass, and then talk about how you've changed it for this year at the time of this tape in 2023. Yeah, sure. So, uh, Stan, as you know, but to remind your uh, viewers, QLAC is a qualified longevity annuity contract, Mm -hmm. and the way we came to this back in 2012, 2014, was to recognize that the qualified plan world, 401ks, tax qualified retirement plans, and the IRA world did not have a deeply deferred annuity, what what people in the insurance industry uh, often called an advanced life deferred annuity, an ALDA, or a deeply deferred annuity, or longevity insurance is another way to describe it. Mm-hmm. And I thought, you know, having been just vaguely familiar with those products uh, and those being relatively niche, not sort of a, you know, a, a main, a large seller in the market. Uh, I thought it would be really helpful for people trying to save for retirement and have security in retirement, a guaranteed lifetime income, if they had this option. Not intended to be uh, the only best, necessarily the best way to provide guaranteed income for yourself for life, but one good option, a kind of thinking person's annuity, if you will. And so we couldn't have it in the IRA or the 401k world. Why? Because of the required minimum distribution rules. You know, the RMD rules that say that once you reach age 72, used to be 70 and a half, you have to start taking out some of your retirement savings uh, gradually in order to pay tax on the amount that you accumulated over the rest of your lifetime or life expectancy. Those rules actually did not sit well with the idea of a deeply deferred annuity. Because if you used your account balance, when you reach age 
but say 72 when those rules kick in, to part of your account balance even, to defer an annuity, to buy an annuity, pay a premium to an insurance company, and the annuity isn't going to start paying you until you're 85 years old or maybe 80 years old. What happens in the meanwhile with that premium? It's supposed to be taxed gradually. You're supposed to be taking it out bit by bit and paying tax on it. Well, that doesn't really work with something that you're turning over to an insurance company for 15 or 20 years, maybe 10 years, and letting them grow it uh, and then promise you a fixed guaranteed dollars per month benefit for the rest of your life starting in, at 80 or 85. So what I tried to do was make it possible for people to have these deeply deferred annuities deferred until age 85 or thereabouts without having to worry about the required minimum distribution rules, these RMDs. And we just created by regulation a rule that said, if you buy one of these deeply deferred annuities, you can get out of the required minimum distribution rules for that amount of premium that you pay. So there's an extra tax break for people in addition to the normal value of having lifetime guaranteed income. Right. You also get out of the RMD rules for the amount that you invest in this. And that's how we were able to do this in the now $20 trillion 401k, 403b, and IRA market. And hold that thought for a second, because when I first heard of qualified longevity annuity contracts, first thing that hit me is all of the stupid people out there that say never put an annuity inside of an IRA, which is hilarious, because this is the the quintessential example of qualified IRA longevity annuity contract. Number two, um, with the stat that you just provided in all of these retirement deferred assets, I, I quickly made a prediction that hasn't come true yet, but it will. That qualified longevity annuity contracts, if you take all the types of annuities out there, would be the number one seller, period, in the story. Eventually, it will be once the people are um, educated and also the financial advisors. I do a lot of speaking, Mark, as you know, and a lot of these big banks and brokers firms bring me in once they boo and the, all the stuff's thrown at me and we clean up the 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 you know the stage then I'll say, listen, if you have a client with an IRA and you're not quoting them a qualified longevity annuity contract, please explain to me how you're a fiduciary. So with all, that all being said, one of my questions to you, and it will get there. I think me and you both will be in the parade in DC, riding on the back of an old Cadillac, waving to the people as they applaud the QLAC, but that's down the road. How hard was it to twist the arm and, as I show, say, show paintings to the blind people. In this case, the blind people would be Congress. How hard was it to get it through initially? Well, it was really surprisingly easy, Stan, because I, really? I didn't go to Congress at all. Well, that's smart. <laughs> yeah. We, <laughs> that's smart. We, uh, we concluded I had a, a, had, had a terrific staff at uh, the U.S. Treasury Department. and. Uh, I put to them the question, could we do this on our own by a regulation mm -hmm. without a change in the legislation, without Congress having to be involved? I wasn't trying to avoid Congress just because we were doing something they wouldn't approve of. On the contrary, I thought they would find it was great. But if they did it themselves, it would take them years probably to actually get it done. <laughs> no doubt. No and doubt get it done right. So we concluded actually in very honestly and in good faith that the statute gave us authority. There was nothing about the law that Congress had put in place regarding any of these things, annuities, retirement benefits, the required minimum distributions. There was nothing about that law that constrained us, prevented us from making this annuity available as a product to see whether the market wanted to, to take it up. And so we issued a proposal by regulation. We told everybody publicly that we're thinking of making this product available. 
we laid out the rules that we thought should apply, all consistent with existing law. But existing law provided some latitude, and no one had ever really thought you could do this by regulation. But we became convinced that it wasn't even a close call. If it was too close a call, I wouldn't have done it because things, certain things are supposed to be done by Congress and they have the authority to do them and they delegate to the regulators within the broad bones of what Congress has enacted. So the regulators should not exceed their authority and therefore we looked hard at that and decided, no, we're not exceeding our authority at all if we do this. This is just an opportunity that hasn't been perceived before. So we said to the market, you can do this. You can have this kind of annuity and you can exclude the premium from these age 72, used to be called age 70 and a half sure. required distributions. And that was the way that Congress did not get involved until a few months ago when they expanded it in the recent secure 2.0 legislation. Did you, and the expansion is now $200,000 is the limit. Before there was some formulas involved. We won't even right. go into those because it's confusing and it was confusing, but now it's 200,000, which I think is fantastic. And I hope just from an incrementalism strategy that mm -hmm. it continues to go up because in a pensionless world, as you know, Mark, you know, people need to create their own pensions in combination with the best annuity on the planet, which is social security. And right. I think that was your, your passion underlying that. Did you have any blowback or concerns from the IRS not getting their uh, additional money from the RMD since QLACs are not included as, as part of that RMD right. calculation? What right. did they say to you, Mark? Did they throw a dart at you? Did they kick you out? What did they do? We, uh, the treasury is like a kind of parent company for the IRS. <laughs> uh, the IRS is like Wait a minute. Use. That's the greatest, that's the greatest thing I've ever heard. The right. Treasury is the parent company for the subsidiary called the IRS, is what you're saying. Correct. Technically that's the case. And in fact it really is the case because wow. the, the IRS commissioner stand, the head of the IRS, and we're talking about a, a big subsidiary, like 85,000, 90,000 people work you better there. believe it yeah the ceo of the irs reports to the secretary of the treasury and i also reported directly to the secretary of the treasury i was senior advisor to the mm -hmm. secretary and my the treasury group that deals with tax policy is like a a sibling to the irs right okay. it's it's part of the parent company but everybody it's a small group of lawyers and economists, and they work closely with the IRS. And it's like we defend the IRS when they need to be defended, which is often uh, <laughs> from unfair criticism. I understand. We work. We work. The Treasury, I'm not there any longer, works really hand in glove with IRS. So there isn't any, you know, there aren't darts going back and forth. We're, we're so close that, you know, if they have issues with something, we hear about it right at the beginning, you know, and mm -hmm. we start to take it into the treasury. People take it into account and say, yeah, I hadn't thought of that, or they may be right, or they've got an administrative problem because the IRS is in charge of, of course, actually it, implementing and administering the tax laws and collecting the tax. So there's a lot of things when it comes to that, they're in charge. You know, whether you get audited, whether somebody's tax, how someone's tax return is reviewed, how much of a refund they get, all of that, the Treasury doesn't get involved in. It's all IRS because it's right. dealing with individuals or companies or businesses. And but but when it comes to policy, like, should we have a new vehicle like this to help people save for retirement or should we issue a regulation or a rule? of a certain kind that will apply to the whole market. That's when Treasury works with IRS in collaboration. And Treasury kind of has the last word uh, on a policy issue. So the IRS, believe it or not, uh, IRS was very supportive. And they, they are not oriented, Stan. And I think many of your viewers may be a little surprised by this. They're not oriented to get as much revenue as possible 
out of the American taxpayers. That's They're, a hard that's a hard sell, Mark, but go ahead. But, yeah, let me explain this. These are people whose job is not to maximize the amount that they can squeeze out of taxpayers. Their job is to follow the law and implement the law. And Congress writes the tax code, God bless them, such as it is, and you know it's a mess, <laughs> but Congress writes the tax code and the IRS administers it. So they're not supposed to, and they don't even try to, collect more tax than the law says you owe. And that's why we get refunds, and sometimes we get corrected on our individuals, like us, on our tax returns. If we do something wrong, and actually it's, it's, would, it, it was to our disfavor, like we paid too much tax, they'll give it back. You know, they'll say, that's wrong. You don't owe us that much. So my point is, these people at IRS, you know, out of 90,000, 85,000 people, obviously you can get all kinds of human beings, but most of them, the vast majority, are honest, straightforward people who are trying to do their job, and their job is administer the tax law according to the law, collect the right amount of tax, not the most tax, not less than the right amount, but the right amount, so that everybody is supposed to know that their neighbors are paying, we hope, the right amount of tax, and therefore you are not being a sucker when you pay the right amount of tax, uh, even if you think you could get away with less. And so they liked this idea a lot. Really? They understood Good. that part of part of what they do, you know, is administer the pension and retirement 401k IRA laws to the extent that those are in the tax code. And so they get that our private pension system is trying to encourage people to do what you're trying to encourage people to do, mm -hmm. you know, and have a secure, dignified retirement, save enough and invest or provide arrangements that will protect them from poverty and retirement, you know, supplementing, as you put it, the best annuity in the world, Social Security, not enough for most of us by itself, not yeah. intended to be enough for, you know, most middle class people. And so they, they liked it. Interesting. I um and that's and that's good news. And it makes sense when you describe the hierarchy of Treasury to IRS. They're just implementing a good idea. I think the other thing too is, and I've said this for a while, if the QLAX, because they didn't you know, follow the stand the annuity man prediction of being an overnight sensation. I do think there'll be a ten year overnight sensation. I think mm -hmm. in about a dec in about a decade from two thousand and fourteen, you know, I think in a couple years, two or three years, um, QLACs are going to hit their stride because the two hundred thousand dollar amount is getting people's attention. I'm just telling you from a person that is licensed in all fifty states, has thousands and thousands of clients and yeah. thousands and thousands of people with QLACs. It's getting their attention. It's now a significant amount that's going to produce a significant lifetime income stream. And what I was getting at is I also think that people are concerned about Social Security. I think the QLAC growth and popularity will help, I think, lessen some demand on Social Security and give, hopefully, politicians some guts and fortitude to possibly update that program to make it more sufficient for the long term. Do you agree with that? I'd like to think that it will <laughs> go, that QLAX will go that way, Stan, that it will become much more popular and widely used over time. And I think one reason that it hasn't been that widely used, and you know this so well, uh, one reason is that the 401k plans, the institutional retirement programs, they have tended to want to see the QLAC be made available to their participants mm -hmm. in an IRA. In other words, the plan could offer a QLAC. A 401k could say, you know, as you know, you can we can have an annuity in the plan as an option for people to select. It could include a QLAC 
but they've been gun shy traditionally about choosing which insurance company and which contract and you know, is the premium a fair deal for our well it flies in the face of fiduciary i mean it flies in the face of providing all um you know quoting all carriers to find the best contractual guarantee my concern about that direction that 401ks are going in are the big you know the people that pay you know it's kind of a pay for play if if they get on the platform then people are going to choose that QLAC that doesn't mean it's the best one because they're commodity products so yeah. i mean i'm concerned about well yeah my 401k offers a QLAC well how many one or two that doesn't work that doesn't work in my opinion. And that's, I think the issues going forward, I think a more, I think a better strategy for the industry is not to focus on the 401k assets, it's to focus on the traditional IRA or rollover IRA assets for QLEX. And yeah. of course, no one listens to me, but I'm telling you that's the way to go do it because the other- people are, Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, and the industry has actually, you know, they've thought that as between the qualified plan, because they're afraid of the, the point you're raising, they're afraid to choose one or two, Yep. not all of them, but they're concerned, you know, why should we stick our necks out as fiduciaries and say, we'll buy this QLAC rather than that QLAC. And they have not yet developed, there are a few you know, marketplaces. For They're annuities. trying. There's oh. some people trying without mentioning names. Sure. But, but, but many of the plan sponsors aren't familiar with those or they're gun shy. And so they're not used to the idea that they could offer any QLAC out there. You know, we're just offering this commodity. Right. And individual can choose which one they want. Uh, so the, the idea in the, in the market typically has been doing what you're doing that is selling them out of iras uh, yes and, and the uh the reason i think that might actually change a bit now is that the law has changed two relevant ways one it's a little easier for a plan fiduciary mm -hmm. right to select annuities now they could still do something like say here's 10 QLACs. You know, we've vetted them all. They're out in the market. They all seem okay. You choose which one you want. Uh, they'd still have a fiduciary duty to make sure that those 10 were all okay. Mm -hmm. I get, you know, if they said every QLAC in the market, here it is, you could choose it. They'd still be worried that maybe there's one bad apple overpriced or something like that. So, but they have less fiduciary exposure than they used to when offering an annuity in a plan. And the other reason I think this may shift a little more, not away from IRAs, but toward plans in addition to offer QLACs, is that we had a rule in our 2014 regulation when we first launched the QLAC that said you couldn't use more than a quarter of your account balance to buy it. Now, why, why say that? If you've got an account balance of a million dollars, why should we say you're limited to 250,000 and actually then there's a dollar limit also sure which started out at 125,000 yep. indexed to inflation uh the reason we did that both limits was going back to our first point here that it was without congress that we created this product if we let too much revenue out the door in general in the market it wasn't irs that would complain really they just have to follow the law uh now they're they would you know say wait a minute are we really following the law if a lot of revenue was lost because we gave an exemption from the required minimum distributions mm -hmm. for too much uh money congress would legitimately say wait a minute that's our job. You know, if we want to give tax advantages and it's a material difference from what we already gave in this in the existing law, we should do that and not the not the regulators. See, and what so I love about QLACs, Mark, 
yeah. is that it is a classless, um, political partyless, yeah, um, melatoninless. Yeah. I mean, right. product that will benefit every single American on the planet with the social security number. Period. Now, the argument from there is some people's IRAs are bigger than some other people's IRAs, or whatever. Yeah, that's a whole nother discussion. But I. That's the reason I'm so passionate about it being the top product, it being the go-to product, it being the product that if you don't know, own any other annuity types, you're going to own that one because it's eerily similar to Social Security and how Social Security works. And um, to me, I think qualified longevity annuity contracts, and we've had calculate that calculator on my site forever. It's an emotional product. And what I mean by that, Mark, and everyone listening, is it gives you the ability to take your personal IRA and attach attach your spouse as a lifetime income participant with you. Right. That is an emotional decision. And most of the people that choose Culex with us that I've spoken with, and we have a huge staff, and you know, but I hear this, is that... One of the spouses, either male or female, is very into markets and very into investing, but they also know that when they pass, their spouse is probably not. There's it's right. it's a very it's a rarity to have two spouses that are traders. They you know, giving my exa my examples, my wife Christine's been married to me for 35 years, could care less, just wants to go see the kids and the grandkids. That's why a QLAX in place so that that's going to happen. She's going to have income coming in in addition to the other income things. And I think it's an easy marketing play if they would just make me czar of the annuity industry, Mark, for just a couple of years, it is, to, is to talk to the breadwinner or the investor in the family, whoever that is, male or female, and say, you know, eventually you're not going to be able to do it. So you're going to have to set things up. And this is the best way to do it with a portion of your IRA assets. I want to ask you kind of a, a different, more nuanced question, which is you're on the policy side of it and the structuring side of it and the and in essence the ivory tower thinking side of annuities and how they should be implemented, period. I need you to take that hat off for a second and and give some commentary on the annuity industry itself for what I feel missing the boat on what is good about some of these products? Well, uh, Stan, I think that in part, they're not giving enough attention to the spousal protection, right? That Agreed. The point you just made, I mean, if you go to Homer Simpson and you ask him whether he wants to buy a QLAC, uh, at first, He's going to say, what the hell? I've had so many beers and so many cheeseburgers in my day. You know, I'm probably not going to live to ever see <clears throat> the better side of age 80. Right. So how hell should I throw my money away, give it to an insurance company? Uh, you then remind him of Marge. Right. You know, she's lived a virtuous life in spite of you, and she's going to live to 100. Uh and you need to think about providing for her. And that, you know, I think that is some, a sales approach that you don't hear enough of in the market. Second, I think the problem also is partly that the virtues of the insurance industry, the ability to provide a guaranteed lifetime income, that is a known amount, a determinable amount, whether you increase mm -hmm. it 2% a year, whether you're able to actually index it for inflation or just mm -hmm. approximate that, uh, or even if you can't do that, you say, look, we can give you $2,000 a month and sure. inflation might eat away at that. You have the option of doing more if you're concerned, but you know what you're getting and it's regulated by the states, that that, uh, that is not the most profitable line of business 
uh, in the eyes of many people in the industry. The, the, the distribution channels. It's the, so myopic, Mark. It's such a horrific uh, uh, thought. Gosh. You know, I could sell this black Model T Ford that is really reliable, works perfectly well. It's very transparent. There's not a lot of uh, hidden nooks and crannies or mm -hmm. options where I might end up overpaying because I said, okay, give me the, you know, the fancy this or that feature. It's, it's a plain vanilla transparent product that could actually work in the free market that we all aspire to have in this country where people mm -hmm. can look at the product and say, okay, I want to compare that to the competition. What is the value? You know, what are the prices and what am I getting? And you can do an apples to apples comparison. So sure. for those annuities, right, the basic income annuity that pays uh -huh. you X dollars a month sure. for the rest of your life, or maybe it's for 20 years or 10 years. And also, let me, let me interject. QLACs yeah. can be structured. The majority that we sell are with cash refund, meaning that the evil annuity yeah. company is never going to keep a penny even right. though they're contractually obligated and on the hook to pay as long as you are breathing, right. which means there's no ROI until you die. I mean, right. it is a straight transfer risk. A lot of people out there think that when you die, the evil company, evil annuity company keeps the money. That's one of many ways to structure it. But the majority right. of people out there that's worked hard for their money, they want to make sure that 100% of it is going to go to somebody in their family. The other thing that I tell I'm people all the time. By the way, if I can jump in. Yeah. We originally designed the QLAC to be as simple as possible. And when we first proposed it, I was not sure whether to allow that feature. You had to. I, yeah, I you thought had to. you had to. But you had I, to. I didn't want the industry to come and say, we have to have these 25,000 whistles on this in order to make it attractive. So we started it out bare bones as a proposal, not, not the real. Sure. Thing. And I put the question to them, do we need a death benefit? And I, I knew what the answer was going to be, but we, we wanted to ask it in a rigorous way and get all people providing the evidence, you know, without taking for granted they'd be able to do it. Because there are lots of types, as you know, and then you can get into, you know. I would, I would have personally squashed it product. nationally. I would have squashed it if you didn't provide that death benefit. Right. And Period. that's, well, that's what we found out. I talked to the people I knew in the industry mm -hmm. and read all the public comments they filed. Mm -hmm. The case that you made that honestly, this isn't a play, the, the refund of premium mm -hmm. when the person dies, if they don't have a beneficiary who's going to keep getting, you know, the mm -hmm. life payments. Sure. Uh, the refund of premium is essential to selling. So you can get away from that fear that the insurance company, you know, will keep all my money if I get hit by the proverbial bus when I leave the, the sales and, and it's essential for people that aren't well-versed in annuities to feel comfortable with the fact that the money doesn't go poof when they die. And that is such a hurdle that we still have to deal with. The other thing that I think is is hurting the QLAC is I would probably go on record to say that either 60 to 70% of all financial advisors in this country do not know what a QLAC is. Really? Absolutely. And what I tell people all the time when they're looking for advisors that obviously I'm the annuity advisor, but for their non annuity assets, I'm like, here's how you here's how you can tell if that person's worth a crap. Ask them what a QLAC is. Mm -hmm. And if they don't know, walk out because they're not acting as a fiduciary. They're not up to speed on what's good for you. And if they're going to manage your IRA assets and they don't know what a QLAC is. That's a big time red flag. And for people that are listening and viewing on this, do that. For your advisor right now, go in there and say, do you know what a QLAC is? If they say, no, nah, not really, I'm not, I hate all annuities, then you, you, you need to fire that person, okay? That's how important it is for the advisors to understand what it is. Here's the other thing, Mark, and this will never happen, but in my dream world of being the annuity czar, if the compensation that's built in, the commissions that are built into all annuities were right. the same, then QLACs would be number one right now. Exactly. And the other thing, too, yeah. that's a problem, Mark, Huge. 
for for the financial world that I used to come from, which was Dean Witter, Morgan Stanley, Payne Weber, UBS, that is a a wrap fee world where they want to charge a fee for managing the assets. When you start going to these masters of the universe and saying, here's a QLAC that's actually good for the customer, but you can't charge a fee on it, they're going to ignore it, even though it's in the client's best interest. Those things have to happen on an institutional level and a financial advice level so that it makes sense for advisors, fiduciaries, masters of the universe, whatever they want to call themselves, to eagerly, proactively offer QLAC quotes to every single client they have with an IRA. We have we have some uphill climbing to do, Mark. Well, to that point, Stan, one of the very experienced people in the industry confided in me a couple of years after the QLAC came out when I was asking, you know, why isn't this getting more take up? I mean, I've got mm -hmm. tremendous feedback and comments from the insurance mm -hmm. companies, sure. from policy people, from consumer type, uh, consumer rights people. This is a great idea. This is really going to be terrific, like what you're saying. And this guy said, you know, Mark, don't tell anybody, you know, who where you heard this. But, you know, there are a lot of people who like it. But the reason it's not more popular is that it doesn't have enough profit buried in it in the form of commissions and that kind of fees that the customer can't see. And that because it doesn't have the complexity, the nooks and crannies where you can bury some fees here and some fees oh, there, God. it's too plain vanilla. It's it too pro-consumer, Mark. It's too good yeah. for the consumer. Yeah, that's insane. And yep. that is the reason that the annuity industry continues to have this cloud over it for bad selling practices. And that person that said that they're right, but it's such a short term, short sighted view of life and of business that they've just I mean, if the industry was on top of it, you know, we wouldn't be having this podcast and, and you on. And 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 they have opened the door wide open for someone like me that totally gets it and is a truth teller and loves simplicity, just to recommend this to pretty much every single person. Yeah. Um, where do you see it headed? I mean, we're at two at the time of this taping. Check the date. Two hundred thousand dollars is the limit per IRA per qualified account. You know, if a husband had one or wife one, they both can have two hundred thousand. Where do you see that headed, Mark? Well. First of all, I think Congress is not going to come back and raise the limit or do probably do other kind of legislation in this area, probably in the next couple of years. Got it. And where I see it headed is that by raising the limit, which we couldn't do by regulation because that does give away more revenue, you know, billions dollars more sure which is good because it's a good investment in people's sure. retirement security so we left it for congress to take this model and dial it up and raise that limit as much as they feel they can afford and so that's what happened when it went from where it was 100 and some thousand to 200 thousand and i think it's going to get more attention we also stand by getting rid of the 25% limit. Thank you for that. That too. But the message of that, I think, is important. And I, I'd be interested in your reaction to this. We put the limit in because the 25% initially, because it helped prevent us from giving away too much revenue. I, I understood so why we you did it. Yeah. We could tell Congress, you know, right. we'll make it a cool product available, but on balance, you're not going to have billions of dollars going out of the, the fist because of this product, you can look at it, be inspired by it, and expand it if you want to. And you can spend that money. And in fact, we recommend that you do that, but that's up to Congress. So I think what's gonna happen is that we're gonna get more take up now and more recognition that this is a, a sensible 
product for most people. If somebody's single and they know they're got a short, they've got a short life expectancy. You know, they've got a they got a very bad diagnosis, and they're you know mm -hmm. sixty seven years old, and the doctor says, you know, if you're lucky, you've got two or three years. That's about it. Okay, that's you know, I don't see that it's for them, but unfortunately, there aren't that many people in that situation. If they are married and they have a spouse who's potentially going to live a long time, then, you know, they can buy it for their spouse or the spouse can buy it. So I do think that, you know, for most people, especially with the death benefit, which is, right, a return of the premium you paid without any growth, that's all right, as long as it's clearly disclosed, you're not going to get the interest or other value. You're, get, you're buying a pension, Earned. period. You're just getting back. Yeah, you're getting back the amount you paid in. Yeah. Plus, if you draw it to zero, the annuity company's on the hook to pay. Here's what I. Here's where the turning point's going to happen. Now, if I was a politician, I'd never be one because I don't want to take the drastic pay cut. But And I'm also sane. But if I was running for office nationally, I would run on the Social Security QLAC platform for lifetime income. I would run on a lifetime income platform. And I would educate people on this. And it's going to take someone to do that or a, or a journalist that actually knows what they're talking about to ask the presidential candidates at a, like, let's just say it's the Democrat or Republican, you know, they have all the candidates on there. Um, I have a question. What is your stance on Social Security payments that are the best annuity on the planet and also the new QLAC, the Qualified Longevity Annuity Contract that Mark Avery has so uh, put out, and he is a, a fantastic person? Why aren't we promoting the QLAC and Social Security as dual lifetime income uh, payments for all of the people out there with IRAs? Then shut up and see what happens. It's going to take that type of event for people to go, hey, hey what's a QLAC? Like? What's a QLAC? Like? Well, hey, what's a QLAC? Like? And then it's game on. But that's what it's going to take. And I might have to show up at one of these um, debates and ask that question, Mark. It would be yeah. beautiful. But it needs to happen in that type of arena. You know, because I, I live in uh, part-time in Ponte Vedra Beach, and Ron DeSantis is from here. I'm, I don't care either way. I'm not a Republican or Democrat. It doesn't matter. But if I'm ever close by and I see him out there on the stump, I'm going to ask him, hey, Ron, what do you think about qualified longevity annuity contracts? Hey, Joe Biden, what do you think about qualified longevity annuity contracts? We have $20 trillion in deferred IRA-type assets. Wouldn't it be good if we promoted everyone to create their own pension in conjunction with that fantastic pension that the government provides called Social Security? Mark, it's got to be that chaotic and aggressive of a moment for us to get out there and for you to get the do of what you've done. Stan, do you think that it helps that the QLAC, because it's deferred from the time you buy it, which could be, you know, whenever it could be when you're 58, it could be when you're mm -hmm. 68, it could mm -hmm. be when you're 71, from the time you buy it till the time it starts paying, when you're 85 or 82 or 80, the fact that that builds up, right, that the insurance company has the opportunity to take the premium and to put it into their general account and invest mm -hmm. it sure. in bonds and, sure. you know, whatever a reasonable rate of return on it, I promise you that no matter what they get by way of their investment returns, they're making you a fixed promise of X dollars a month when, when you reach that age of 80 or 85. Mm -hmm. The fact that you've got that delay means, as you know, that the amount that you get per premium dollar that you pay the insurance company, it's a larger, at least nominal amount. Right. Because the money has time to grow within the insurance company. Sure. So you can spend less of your account balance. If your nest egg right. is X dollars, you might be able to spend 25% of X or 15% of X, or if you want, you know, half of X on this annuity product and keep the rest. If you want to keep the rest to manage yourself, to invest, to, to 
you know, be, take more risks with, you know that you have this guarantee to fall back. It's part of the income floor, Mark. And the income floor is social security, pension, if you're so lucky, and this additional pension using qualified longevity annuity contracts. I tell people all the time, you know, let's look at the downside in their minds of what a QLAC would be. And it would be the non-trackable interest rate during the deferral time period. But what I tell people is look at it from a Southerner standpoint. The more you, the more you let it cook, the more you get, the yep. more you allow them to, to hold on the money, uh, the longer, the more they're going to enhance that payout on the back end. And the true value proposition of any lifetime income stream annuity, including Culex, is the fact that if you live forever and your account's at zero, they are on the hook to pay. They are on the hook to pay. And and that, to me, is a, is I mean, annuities as a category is the only category that can provide that transfer of risk lifetime income stream. No other, no other product can do that. Mark, we've got to close it up a little bit here in the next couple of minutes. And I really appreciate you being on. This is Mark Avery. I'm going to have all of his stuff on our site. You can uh, read his bio. I mean, it is unbelievable. Obviously got a Harvard law degree. His father was a biblical scholar and researcher. Is that correct, Mark? Yeah. Yeah. He was uh, actually in the underground during World War II also before his scholarly career uh really took off when he was in his 20s uh he was rescuing people from the nazis and during wow. world war ii uh and wow. you know he his life almost you know was taken several times in various ways during the war but he he made it survived and uh was able to get a lot of people out uh into you know the u.s what? or other what countries. a what a motivator to live. I mean, to yep. to have as a father. What what is um what's making you get up in the morning and go get it every day, Mark? You still have passion. You can hear it in your voice. You can't hide it. What is um what's the passion for Mark Avery? Well, it's to help working people get more economic security. To help people. Uh, be secure both in terms of retirement and health health care. I work a lot on the health reform, mm-hmm. trying to get everybody covered by by some kind of decent health insurance. Affordable Care Act is what I was involved in, uh, helping to implement that. And, uh, and now you're doing the affordable pension. income. It's now the Affordable Income Act, right? Well, it's... <laughs> it is it is two these are two peas in a pod yeah. people need health security and they need retirement security and just like we have social security and we have medicare mm-hmm. to take care of those two things uh on top of social security we've got our private pension system and on top of medicare we've got our private health care system with employer sure. sponsored plans and all the rest so that's that's my passion. I am trying to support and improve and reform those systems. Uh, and I share your, you know, interest in in Social Security and in, you know, Medicare, its counterpart, sure. being also as solid and as consumer friendly and solvent uh, in the long term as, as possible. That is a mic drop moment. I, I typically ask people to give me a mic drop moment, and you just did, um, which is fantastic. And it's been a pleasure to have you on. Certainly want you on again, because we just kind of scratched the surface of how the QLAC thing happened. Um, I love the product. It's my fa- It's one of my favorite, if not my favorite annuity product since I wrote the book in 2014. Um, and if you want to learn more about QLAX, go to my site at theannuityman.com, run quotes 24-7, 365. We have the best calculator on the planet. And I've also allowed you to download the QLAC owner's manual. We used to ship them, Mark, but we, the, <laughs> we're getting so many res- um, you know, requests for it that it just, with paper prices, it's gotten a little out of hand. But um, <laughs> I'm delighted that you wrote that book, Stan. Yeah. I, I, I've read it. I think it's terrific. I recommend it to people. 
I appreciate it. I tell people when I write, it's it's me. It's it's kind of like me talking without the cuss words. It's kind of you know, it's very very simple and to the point. But Mark, I really appreciate you being with us, and I appreciate every single person that joined us on all major podcast platforms, and the Fun with Annuities YouTube channel, the number one annuity podcast on the planet. This Fun with Annuities. We will see you next time.